God, your name is holy. Your reputation is flawless, and we owe you all honor and submission and obedience. God, as we take the next several moments to reflect on the coming of Christ Jesus into the world, I pray that those of us who believe you, who have embraced you as Lord, that our hearts, God, would rejoice and be so thrilled to see the truths mentioned and detailed in your word. God, there is no greater privilege than to know you, to be known by you, to open up your word and see again and again the same truths that we know love, uh, even those that we are discovering to make new discoveries from your word as you enlighten our eyes from your clear words. And God, I pray if there are any among us who do not know you, who continue to harden themselves against your authority, that this would be convicting for them, God, that this would be a piercing message that compels them to let go of the sin uh, that they continue to cling to, that they would be convinced from the text this morning that you are worthy to be praised, you are worthy to be worshiped, and the best thing that we can do is to submit ourselves to that one great aim. And we pray all these things in Christ's name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. If you need a Bible, we're going to have some guys uh, pass out Bibles, so you can just hold up your hand if you want a copy of God's Word. And in your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. It was around the time that I uh, first began to really study the doctrine of the perspicuity of Scripture, the clarity of Scripture, that this passage that we'll look at this morning actually came to mind as I started to think about the issue biblically and talk to others a little bit about it as I started to gain greater understanding. And this particular passage came to mind in Matthew chapter 2 because it's an excellent example of the clarity of Scripture because in this passage, the Scriptures are so crystal clear that even the birthplace of the Messiah was clearly identified it seemed almost easy to the Jews who had the scriptures to discern the specific name of the city in the land of Israel where this long-awaited Messiah would be born. And so that got me thinking, what else is that clear from this passage? What else have I perhaps been missing that's so clear from this particular passage. And this morning, I want to describe two features of this passage that offer much needed clarity for the Christmas season. Two features from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, that offer much needed clarity specifically for this Christmas season. Let me read our passage for us. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Matthew chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east 
and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. The first feature of this passage that offers us much needed clarity for the Christmas season is the worthiness of Jesus. The worthiness of Jesus. This is so clear from this text that Jesus Christ is worthy. His worthiness is on full display here. And Jesus' worthiness is on full display in this text in several ways. First, the worthiness of Jesus is proven by the very timing of the Magi's arrival. His worthiness is proven by the timing of the Magi's arrival. Look again at verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, etc. This all occurred shortly after Jesus was born. How does that prove Jesus' worthiness? Well, Jesus had just been born. That means he had not done anything worthy of notice. He was still a child, still young. He had just been born recently when all of these events unfolded. All he did was be born. There were no miracles that he had performed. He had not raised anyone from the dead. He had not fed multitudes of people. He didn't heal any sick. He had not opened the eyes of the blind just yet. There was no phenomenal preaching or teaching that had come from Jesus. He had not died yet. He had not resurrected yet. None of that. And yet, he is still worthy of searching out. He is worthy, as we read, of the worship of these magi. But all he did, had done up to this point was to be born. He merely came into the world in human flesh, and all of his amazing works would come later. If the magi are acknowledging Jesus worth before he has accomplished anything here on earth, then it is safe to conclude, it is right to conclude, that the ultimate reason for his worthiness that's recognized by the Magi must not be anything that he had done here on earth. In other words, the worth of Jesus isn't primarily in what he does but it must be simply in who he is. Jesus' worth is inherent to who he is. His worth does not originate with what he does. 
specifically for us in time, space, in history. Think about how profound that is. We rightly worship Christ for his death and resurrection. Apart from that, we would not even be able or compelled to worship Christ. And so worshiping Jesus for what he accomplished for sinners, the humility that he practiced to go all the way to the cross and die the brutal, embarrassing, and shameful death of sinners, to worship him for that reason is absolutely appropriate. We should, and we do. But dare I say, if that is what, if what he has done specifically for you, if the benefits that you experience for Christ are the foundation or the primary reason you worship him, if you worship him ultimately because of the ways you benefit, then you don't actually love Christ, but you love self. Even to worship Christ for the gospel must ultimately be because he is glorified by the gospel. To say it another way, if Christ would be more glorified by the condemnation of sinners, would that also be worthy of worship? Would he be worthy of our worship then? If he didn't benefit us at all, would we still acknowledge that he is still worthy of worship? It's a good heart check to discern whether you love Jesus or whether you love self. The f mere fact that the Magi recognized Jesus' worthiness prior to any of those ways that they could have benefited, and you see in what we have just read, he didn't do anything for them, even after they found him. They rejoiced not because of something they received from Christ. They rejoiced because they found Christ. We ought to imitate their example. And this is the heart of a true worshiper, to worship Christ primarily for who he is and not for what he does for us specifically and the ways he benefits us specifically. The aspect of Jesus' character that is most on display in this passage, the reason that the Magi find him so worthy of worship, is the second proof in this text for Jesus' worthiness. Jesus' worthiness in this passage is not only proven by the timing of the Magi's arrival, but it's also proven by Jesus' title in the Magi's question. Jesus' title in the Magi's question, verse 2, where is he, they ask, who has been born king of the Jews? That is who he is. Not what he does, that is who he is. He is the king of the Jews. It is Christ's right to Israel's kingship that is the whole reason the Magi's are seeking him out. Now, in that phrase, in that four words in your English Bible, king of the Jews, there is a lot of theology bound up in that phrase. King of the Jews. That is no small deal. In fact, in this phrase, king of the Jews, in that title, is bound up really everything the Old Testament prophets prophesied about the coming Messiah. Let me just give you a few examples. In this one who is king, who is ruler of the Jews, this implies what was stated in Genesis 22 and 24. This is the descendant of Abraham and Isaac who would possess the gate of his enemies. He would conquer Israel's foes as king. Also bound up with this idea of him being king, this coming 
King Genesis 50, Jacob's prophecy, Israel's prophecy to his sons, when he specifically mentions Judah in verse 15, he says that the scepter, which is a ruler's staff, a king's staff, would not depart from Judah, and that nations, peoples, would submit themselves to this future ruler. This coming king would own the obedience and submission of a multitude of people groups as the one who conquered Israel's enemies. Also included in this idea, 2 Samuel 7, David's descendants would reign on his throne in Jerusalem. This descendant would reign on the throne in Jerusalem. That promise was given to David. He would be the descendant of David, 2 Samuel 7. What David also wrote in Psalm 2 is bound up in this idea of the king of the Jews, that Yahweh's anointed king would rule the nations with a rod of iron. Psalm 110, David's Lord, who sits at Yahweh's right hand, who waits for God to subdue his enemies, would one day fill the nations with corpses as the judge of all the earth. This is the king of the Jews. Zechariah 6, this same one, who will sit on the throne and rule from a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, will for the first time in history simultaneously hold the offices of king as well as priest of Israel. That is what it meant for him to be king of the Jews. Now, just how much of this was already known by the Magi, we're not told. But all of these ideas go hand in hand with the king of the Jews. They are inseparable from this one who would be king. And so when they come looking for the king, this is the one that they're searching for. This proves since he would be the judge of all the earth, the one to whom all peoples would one day pledge their allegiance, he is worthy. He is worthy of worship. Jesus' worthiness is further proven by the intention of the Magi's journey. The intention of the Magi's journey. Again, in verse 2, we saw his star in the east, and we have come specifically to worship him. They explicitly say why they have come, why they have embarked on this long journey to find him. What's so pressing? Well, the goal is singular. The aim is singular. It is mere worship. To ascribe worth to this one who is worthy. They aren't adding worth to Jesus. They are not improving Jesus' worthiness, they are merely there to acknowledge to him and anyone else present, he's worthy. And this is really what the word worship even means, to ascribe worth to someone or something. This is what they're here to do. And this was worth that journey. The worthiness of Jesus is further proven. Again, by the effect of the Magi, Magi's announcement. The effect of the Magi's announcement. You see it there in verse 3. When they announced to the lesser king, quote-unquote, Herod, that they were there to worship the ultimate king of the Jews, when Herod heard this, verse 3, he was troubled. And not only him, but all Jerusalem with him, troubled. This means they were stirred up. They were unsettled by this announcement that the king of the Jews had arrived. Herod the king was troubled for good reason, as the current king over the people, the current ruler of Israel, of this territory, he was troubled for good reason if there's a greater king who's been prophesied about, who has finally arrived. 
but everyone else in the city was also unsettled with him. This means that either by virtue of Herod's being troubled, that he then troubled the citizens of Jerusalem, because the ruler was troubled, everyone else had reason to be unsettled as well because of what the retaliation from Herod would be. And we see that even further in the passage in verse 16 when he goes and he slaughters the male children in Bethlehem and all his vicinity. But also another good reason for the citizens of Jerusalem to be equally troubled by Herod or equally troubled as Herod is what was foretold about this king and specifically Jerusalem. This king's arrival didn't just mean, it wasn't just a foreboding warning for Herod, but also for Jerusalem as well, for the citizens there. You just direct your attention to Zephaniah. We've been studying this in small group. In Zephaniah chapter 1, as the prophet foretells this coming day of Yahweh, this coming day of the Lord, what he has been emphasizing is the Lord's personal punishment of the entire earth. The sinners, the evildoers, the idolaters on earth would be personally, personally punished by God. But this wouldn't just be a worldwide punishment when this day came. But specifically, God's people who dwelled in Jerusalem would be punished in particular. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 12 says, It will come about at that time on the day of Yahweh that I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, Yahweh will not do good or evil. Moreover, their wealth will become plunder and their houses desolate. Yes, they will build houses, but not inhabit them, and plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. This is specifically the citizens of the city of Jerusalem. On this day of the Lord, the sinners in Jerusalem were in trouble. And so if the Lord has finally arrived in person, then perhaps this is the day they could have said. Perhaps this is the time spoken of by the prophet when Yahweh will have his day of vengeance on unrepentant Israel. And so everyone's troubled by this arrival. The king has come. Everyone's unsettled. His worthiness further is proven by the costliness of the Magi's search. Just think they had to spend study. They had to spend time studying the scriptures to know what they knew. They had to track celestial movements as for at least somewhere between 12 and 24 months, they had been tracking the stars to see it finally be directly overhead where Christ was, the city of Bethlehem. This took study, and so it was costly in that regard. It took time to em embark on the journey, to track those celestial movements for that amount of time. And obviously it took resources as they came and delivered their, their gifts, their treasures to the Messiah. This was a costly search, and yet they found it absolutely appropriate and worth the cost. There's no reluctance that we, we see in the text from them that they would go to such great lengths to acknowledge the worthiness of Christ. We ought to be eager to go to great lengths 
to acknowledge the worthiness of Christ. What does Christ require? Obedience in what area of life? No cost is too high. If it will bring him glory, then it is worth the price. Again, his worthiness finally is proven by the details of Micah's prophecy. The details of Micah's prophecy prove the worthiness of this king of the Jews, Jesus. We read this in our scripture reading from Micah chapter 5, and this is the, the very quote that's mentioned in verse 6. It was written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the re- leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people. One verse from Micah's prophecy, and it accentuates the worthiness of Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. It accentuates his worthiness in several ways. Let me just give these to you briefly. In Micah 5, the city of his birth proved Jesus' worthiness. And it's mentioned by name. How clear is that? A prophecy. Bethlehem. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. This city proved the worthiness of Christ. This is the same city as David's birth. Hence, it was called the city of David. This was, as you even see in this, in this prophecy from Micah, it was a humble city, obscure, of, of no renown. Even though David was born there, it never rose to any great prominence. There was nothing other than David's birth that seemed to be special about this city. But that's actually what makes it such a perfect place for Christ. For Christ to be born there, to demonstrate the humility of God, even in human flesh, the great God who inhabits eternity, who can't be held, can't be contained by the highest heavens, is so great that he can be humble. And he's born in obscurity, in a stable, no less, in this little obscure town of Bethlehem. And just consider the comparison as you think about David, this being the city of David, of David's birth, and then this becoming the same place of Christ's birth. There's a an incredible comparison, uh, similarity happening here by God ordaining Bethlehem to be the birthplace of the Messiah. David was born in Bethlehem and then went on to reign as king in Jerusalem. David's humble beginnings in Bethlehem were followed by his exaltation to the throne in Jerusalem. So his humility was followed by exaltation. That's the pattern that was set in David's life. By God making Bethlehem the birthplace of the Messiah meant that likewise the Messiah would first be born in Bethlehem and then reign like David in Jerusalem. First, it would be Christ's humility, then his exaltation. That's the pattern. Jesus is the perfect son of David in this way. First humility in Bethlehem, then exaltation one day in Jerusalem. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the idea regarding Bethlehem is that it would be his going forth. He would go forth from Bethlehem, specifically for Yahweh. That just means he would begin in Bethlehem in an earthly sense, and he would begin to accomplish God's will from that city. He would go forth for me, the text says. And specifically, he would go forth for Yahweh to be ruler in Israel. 
So not only is the detail of Micah's prophecy proving Christ's worth by the city of his birth, but also the submission of his will. This would not be for himself. He would go forth from Bethlehem for me, says God. So he was submitted in his will to God. And then the authority of his role is also on display. He would go forth as ruler, as ruler. So that's demonstrating the authority of this role. He would be ruler specifically in Israel. And he's called a shepherd later in the passage. As ruler, he would lead, he would rule, he would shepherd God's people. And just notice, according to Micah 5, 2, where this would take place. This would be in Israel. This would be in Israel, a, a specific geographic location. This is not he would be ruler in the hearts of people. This is not he would be ruler in heaven, although he is both of those things. <laughs> this is specifically a prophecy about a place where he would rule. And he has not done that yet. Amen. <laughs> this is still future. He would be ruler in Israel. And then finally, in, again, in this one verse, the beginning of his mission or his commissionings from God are also proving his worthiness in these details of this prophecy. Again, still in verse 2 of Micah 5, his goings forth are from everlasting, from the ancient days. When he goes forth from Bethlehem, that's not the first time that he's, he's going forth for God. This has been happening from the beginning of time. He has been going forth to accomplish the will of God. And so those phrases, everlasting, ancient of days, uh, sometimes and by some scholars is taken to refer to his eternal existence, but probably more so a reference to how long he has been accomplishing the will of God the Father. It's been from everlasting, from the ancient days. When God said, let there be light, Christ accomplished that. He went forth to accomplish the will of his Father. And then we see in subsequent passages, he appears over and over and over again as the angel of Yahweh, as the word of Yahweh, to speak as God, for God, to protect God's people, to safely bring them into the promised land, to accomplish God's will on behalf of his people, as we've been hearing for weeks now from Mark. His goings forth certainly are from everlasting and from the ancient days. These details of Micah's prophecy just prove the worthiness of Christ. They're proven in the timing of the Magi's arrival, proven by his title in the Magi's question. The worthiness of Christ is proven by the intention of the Magi's journey. It's proven by the effect of the Magi's announcement, proven by the costliness of the Magi's search, and proven by the details of Micah's prophecy. Jesus Christ is worthy. You must believe that today. Christian or not, you must believe Jesus Christ is worthy of your worship. If you believe Christ for salvation, then to acknowledge again the worthiness of Christ will compel you to obey him in every area of your life. If you believe Christ's worthiness, this impacts your, your walk day to day. When you are encountering temptations, then to recall the worthiness of Christ will be a compelling motivation to deny yourself and obey him. He is worthy of your worship in that sense. And if you do not believe Christ, then to believe today perhaps for the first time that he is worthy, to acknowledge the inestimable worth of Christ will compel you to believe him and embrace him 
as your Lord and Savior and be saved from his coming judgment. That is appropriate and right and good. The final feature of this passage that I want us to see that offers us much needed clarity for this Christmas season is secondly, the depravity of man. The depravity of man. In addition to the worthiness of Christ being crystal clear from this passage, so is the depravity of man. This is evident in a couple of ways. This is exhibited exhibited or evident in the Jews, and this is also evident in the Gentiles. The depravity of man is evident in both the Jews and the Gentiles in this passage. Why do I say the Jews? First, look at verse 5 of Matthew chapter 2. When Herod had gathered all the chief priests and all the scribes of the people, there was no one more familiar with God's scriptures than these people in the nation of Israel. They were the most studied They were the most acquainted with God's law, had memorized, had studied, had read the most. And so he wants the best to answer this question, where is this king going going to be born? I need to know where he is, Herod said. And so when he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born, they don't call a council together. They don't say, give us some time to search the scriptures and figure this out. They come to King Herod, and when the question goes forth, right back comes an answer. This is an easy one. In Bethlehem, they know. And in case you're wondering whether we know what we're talking about, we'll chapter and verse you, King, and tell you exactly what the prophet says. And they do in verse 6. This is a testament to the depravity of man. Why? Because notice verse 9, who leaves the answer to that question and goes to find the king? After hearing the king, they, that is the magi, the Gentiles from the east, went their way. And the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. None of the chief priests, none of the scribes go to see the king. Completely apathetic to the king's arrival. How hard-hearted must you be to know where the king is who's been prophesied for ages and not even desire to go see him? They wouldn't even take the six-mile, less than six-mile trek south to Bethlehem to go worship this long-awaited king. They wanted nothing to do with this king. That is an incredible degree of depravity on display in this passage. They had clarity, and yet they were completely apathetic, opposed to the worthiness of Christ, opposed to the worship of this coming king. But this isn't a Jewish problem. Their apathy, their opposition to the king of the Jews is not a Jewish issue. This is a human problem, which is why you see the depravity of man further illustrated in this passage in Gentiles, namely King Herod. It is exhibited, the depravity of man is exhibited in Herod's hypocrisy. Verse 8, go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. Completely hypocritical. He is feigning a desire to worship Christ. He is insincere. He is not earnest. He doesn't want to worship Christ. He wants to kill him, which is why verse 12, the Magi are warned in a dream and they don't return to Herod. It's also the depravity of man exhibited by Gentiles is seen not only in Herod's hypocrisy, but also in his bloodthirstiness. Just after what we read 
verse 16, then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. So apparently Jesus was no more than two years old, somewhere between one and two, which probably ruins every uh, depiction of the nativity you've ever seen. <laughs> he was not wrapped in swaddling clothes. He was somewhere between one and two. And so Herod destroys every male child in Bethlehem and the surrounding area. Later in Jesus' ministry, this should have made it obvious that God was doing something unique through Jesus because he would have been the only male born in Bethlehem when he was born from that city who survived. And Herod certainly wouldn't have carried out these orders uh, himself, the killing of all these male children, but he would have commissioned his soldiers to do these things. And so other Gentiles participate in the slaughter. The worthiness of Christ, the worthiness of Jesus, as well as the depravity of man are very clear in this passage. We would be remiss if we did not also, though, just mention the kindness of God on display here. Because just as certainly as the depravity of the Gentiles is on display, notice that there's a mixture. It's not just hard-heartedness on display from the Gentiles, but remember the Magi from the East, not from Israel. They're Gentiles. What's happening with them? From these few men, God has produced true worshipers, sincere worshipers of the King of the Jews. This is how Matthew begins his gospel, with Gentiles seeking out the Messiah, with God's salvation coming to the Gentiles, being embraced by Gentiles. And do you remember how Matthew ends his gospel? Go to the very end of the book. Amidst all the hard-heartedness of the Jews detailed in this gospel account, God's tremendous, undeserved kindness to the Gentiles is on full display. His salvation at the beginning of the book is embraced, is found by Gentiles. In Matthew 28, 19, his salvation goes to the Gentiles. Go therefore, Jesus says, and make disciples of all the nations, all the ethne. That is not Jews. That is other people groups outside of the Jews. How kind is God to send his saving message of the gospel to the Gentile nations? That is why you sit here today, Christian. Because in Tempe, Arizona, there's a Gentile, primarily Gentile church, because this mission was obeyed by the apostles and subsequent faithful church leaders. The Gentiles have received the message of salvation. And even today, God's kindness continues to be on display. Worship Christ in this Christmas season. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your trustworthy word. There is no degree of thanksgiving. There are no words there's no vocabulary, there's no amount of words that we could adequately offer to you to really capture the degree to which we should be thankful for these things. You are so worthy. Even your wrath is worthy of being put on display, and yet you have made so many vessels of mercy 
what grace, what grace. Humble us under your mighty hand in this season. Make us faithful ambassadors of this gospel message to Jews and Gentiles alike, all to whom we have contact. And God, we pray you would use us to make your name famous. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.